Um, our next speakers, um, Eric here, he founded Tool US, started many hacker spaces, and worked in the US Department of Energy, developing attacks and defenses for tamper evidence seals. Now he runs a physical security company called Rift Recon. Ryan has launched the data haven Haven Co. Uh, built satellite wireless networks in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And now he runs a trusted computing company, CryptoSeal. Together, they've been developing um, novel seal and cryptographic technologies to thwart physical attacks on computing devices, such as what you'd find from an evil maid. So i turn it over to you guys. Awesome. Uh. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Christy. And Christy, also, uh, I look forward to when you pass the bar. Uh, we're, all, we're all friends. So, and when you do, first drinks on me. <laughs> all right. So let's get started. So this is thwarting evil made attacks, uh, physically and clonable functions for hardware tamper detection. My name's Eric Michaud, and this is Ryan Lackey. In case hair, no hair. You can separate us during the talk. It's easy. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> let's get started. So. Um, what are we going over today? First off, what are evil made attacks? And then we're gonna go over who is at risk. It turns out everyone in this room is probably at risk at some point, uh, more so than they were a few years ago. Uh, how is it done? What are the methods of attack uh, that are common and more esoteric? And then how can we be safer? And what new SEAL technologies are coming out that you can implement yourself? So, all right. So, yep. Uh, Here's a little bit of my, here's my CV, just a little bit of it. Um, I was the co-founder of Tool US. Some of you may know, some of you might not know. Um, I started uh, Tool US in uh, 2004, and I co-founded a few hackerspaces in Rift. Uh, I'm really, uh, I mean, like, I don't really have any engineering degrees, but I am a self-taught engineer, a machinist, a hacker, and now, now an actual CEO. I have staff I have to look after and have great responsibilities. Uh, I've always been a breaker of physical systems. I love breaking things. I've, uh, figured out attacks for multi-locks. Some of you might be aware of Medico, almost certain alarm sensors, um, and uh, many other high security systems, including voting machines. While I was at Argonne National Lab, we did uh, the verification of the uh, voting machine hacks from Princeton University, and we invented a lot of new stuff there, too. And uh, also now, I'm currently um, through a partnership of Rift and Exploit Hub, some of you don't know what that is. It's a uh, soft, our non-O-Day site. Uh, we built their, we're building their whole hardware directory, so check it out. Uh, I'm Ryan Lackey. I started uh, Haven Co. with a couple other people back in around 2000. It was the world's first offshore data haven in the North Sea nearby. Uh, I worked on anonymous electronic cash payment systems using blinded protocols. Uh, I'm a security consultant in payment technology and cryptographic hardware. And I founded a satellite and wireless networking company in Iraq and Afghanistan, so a pretty high threat environment back during the, uh, the conflict. And uh, I also operated U.S. military medical imaging uh, systems in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kuwait. And now I'm one of the co-founders of CryptoSeal. We do trusted computing technology development. And we actually ran a uh, VPN provider for a while. Uh, it was a consumer VPN. We were just using it as a sort of a demo of some of our technology. And when this whole LavaBit fiasco happened where they were compelled to disclose their keys, we preemptively shut it down because our current system wasn't resistant against it. But we're working on a system that actually will. So hopefully next year we'll have something great in that regard. So stick around. So what is an evil made attack? Uh, an evil made attack is an attack performed by uh, a trusted entity, uh, specifically in uh, you know, the hotel industry, if you will. You uh, suspect that the, the maid that comes to clean your room is someone who's benign, but in fact often they're used by uh, nation states, intelligence agencies, or corporations in many cases where it's really their staff, and they come in to really clean up, so to speak. Um, they, <laughs> American idioms aside, but uh, you know, bug your laptops, st steal intellectual property, or any number of different, different things. Yeah, and I would say these really came to mass uh, knowledge uh, in the security community back in 2009 when Johanna uh, Rakowski from Invisible Things Lab uh, published a paper about attacking TrueCrypt using invisible made attacks. And that sort of shows one of the interesting things about these attacks is they have some unique characteristics. They're a way to get per persistent access and pivot to other systems, and they bypass a lot of conventional defenses. A lot of the things that you've already built for security uh, make certain assumptions about the integrity of your physical hardware, and they just sort of like hand wave away, say, if somebody gets access to your physical hardware, uh, all bets are off. 
But the problem is people get access to your hardware all the time, so it's really not very helpful to say if they get access to your physical security, we're not going to help you. So we had to come up with some stuff, and the security community needs to come up with things that will work in that environment. So who is at risk? Originally, it was you know, uh, government entities, uh, intelligence uh, community, or major criminals. Uh, but nowadays, it's travelers with business, science, and engineering, and intellectual property. How many of you, how many of you in the room, um, I mean, some of you are young, so you might not be working at a large company, or uh, even, not that you want to, but working in an area where you're developing something that's unique, that's valuable. Raise your hand. Whether it's source code, uh, you know, a new, um, you know, actually pretty much all your hands are up. I don't have to explain yeah. any further. So it yeah. doesn't even need to be a yeah. company. It could be your academic research. So people yeah. that are PhD students or, or working on anything, or even a personal project that somebody wants access to. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to tell us, but how many of you are activists? Raise your hand. Some of you, okay. <laughs> this is definitely relevant for you. Um, how many of you play poker? I, saw, I know some of you have seen poker stars bags going around, but, uh, but are online gamers. In some way, you deal with cash or some other value exchange. Cool. And uh, journalists, some journalists in here. Yep, let's see a few hands. And uh, people who have lived or are living. Or, or have, have able... family members who live in war zones. So I'm going to see a few hands go up. OK, yeah, the, you guys are actually at risk. It's no longer the, the people at the top of the food chain. So what changed? Yeah. So really what's happened is it's a few things. Uh, the government sort of has changed its focus. It used to be that intelligence agencies' primary adversaries were other major state intelligence agencies. Now, most of the big intel intelligence agencies are focused on small groups, terrorists, uh, non-state non actors. So they've developed a lot of technology that's sort of targeted on that kind of smaller threat. Um, people travel in, in internationally a whole lot more. Uh, it's really cheap. It used to be expensive and difficult, but we flew here from the US for this conference. A lot of people fly across international borders all the time. And uh, it's pretty frequent. Uh, they also carry a lot of vulnerable stuff with them. It used to be you'd travel with maybe a, a physical notebook and a pen and maybe a film camera. And now you travel with laptop, cell phone, tablet, e-reader, camera, uh, fitness dev device, uh, flash drive, all sorts of stuff, and just in one bag. So people carry a lot of stuff around with them. And, and items that actually carry a lot more information than just a notebook. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot and, easier to do, too. Yeah. In addition to the nation state threat, there's a lot of ways that commercial entities can now make a lot of money by compromising accounts. In the news, there's been, uh, there have been a bunch of big attacks on major retailers where huge numbers of credit cards were compromised, all sorts of compromise. So it, it's very profitable now to have a commercial or criminal organization attack. Yeah. Also, attack if data. you get first to market when a new technology is about to come out and you beat them to it, you get first mover advantage. Yeah. So the thing is, it's, it's, it really pays to not pay for research, it turns out. Yeah. So it's a pretty scary world. Yeah. Uh, so to illustrate this, we've come up with some scenarios on exactly how uh, users can be attacked you know, while they're in, in various environments. Uh, so we've got business travelers that are doing international travel. We've got activist organizations, the gaming user, uh, journalists, and people that live in war zones. And we'll go through those and describe some uh, security threats they face, some counter conventional countermeasures they have, and how those countermeasures are defeated through physical attacks. So first up is the international business traveler. And it's not really an executive, necessarily. It could be anybody. It could be, some, it could be a student. It could be an engineer. Actually, engineers and scientists are among the, the uh, main targets for this right now. And uh, one of the things they do is they carry a lot of intellectual property on the device. They have source code. They have research findings. They have everything else. Uh, so there's information that the adversary wants to steal from their devices. There's also they access systems back at home. They, they keep online to keep working, because it's kind of crazy to go on a vacation or a, a work trip and not have access to your systems. So they can attack your system while you're in a country and use that to attack your systems back at home. And the, the scariest thing is they can actually attack your uh, device while you're in a country and leave something on the machine, take it, you take it back to your home network, plug it in, and it keeps attacking your home network, which might be protected. So that's a pretty big threat. Uh, one of the unique threats that these people face is border checkpoints. So in a lot of countries, you have pretty good rights and personal, personal liberties uh, when you're inside the country, um, in the US, in the EU, lots of other places, UK. The problem is, at borders, a lot of those rights are either limited or suspended. And as we've seen, uh, that's pretty scary. So they can require that you uh, uh, 
uh, turn over a machine to them for a certain period of time and they'll give it back to you. They can require that you type stuff into your computer and all sorts of other stuff. So you might think, oh, I'm just going to encrypt all my drives. Uh, there's an obvious attack to that. They just tell you you must decrypt it. And if they're pointing a gun at you or holding you in a checkpoint or something, you can't really like say, no, I'm not going to do it. I mean, you can, but it becomes a legal challenge. Yeah. Uh, and once they, even if they don't get your encryption key, they just image your drive. So they've got an encrypted uh, image, and then they can go out and get your, your key later and, and decrypt your, uh, your data there. Yeah, and that can be done through any number of different methods, with, yeah, whether will. through video surveillance or other types of uh, ways of driving that key, or just brooding it over time. Yeah, especially on something like a cell phone or something that you're accessing all the time. You're going to use a pretty short passphrase. Uh, another threat is the hotel maid, uh, <laughs> sort of the, the, the origin of the term evil maid. Um, you, you, so you rent a hotel room. It's expensive and small, and you might want to have somebody clean it every couple of days. So the, uh, the maid will come in. They have access. They don't have to wait for you to give them access to the room each time. There's a door lock, and the maid has access, either a master key if it's a conventional system or another digital key. And uh, they can come in, and you're gone, and they know you're gone for a while. You keep a travel schedule. They know you're out at a restaurant, or they know you're in a meeting, or whatever else. So they know you're going to be out of the room for a certain period of time. And the threat is not so much that a maid becomes evil, it's that an evil person becomes a maid. Uh, an intelligence agent or... <laughs> true, true story, <laughs> yeah. true story. Yeah. So, <laughs> so in, a, in a country, um, a Pacific uh, bordering country, actually <laughs> a couple of those, the, um, the nation state's intelligence apparatus will send people into your room and image your drive while you're out if you're there for meetings, and it's pretty widely known. Um, there's a lot of problems with that. They can attack your machine. They can also attack the room. So they could bug your room. And they, could, they have some control over what room you're assigned to. So there's a pretty big vulnerability there. So uh. you might think that you can use a safe, though it turns out there's a lot of problems with those, like master codes, um, ways to bypass. Like on this safe right here, um, the bottom right of the panel, there's a little, you see a little off color you know, circle that's actually a bypass key. So if you know, there's a lockout like the battery fails or some other mechanisms inside is not performing correctly, you can pick that. And uh, all hotel safes are not rated for, by any security standard that I'm familiar with. Um, they just say it's secure. Um, so it doesn't have any time to attack, like takes 15 minutes with tools, they're just, they're not really that good. And, um, and you can also take the panels off, do something called spiking, which is you pull the wires out to the solenoid, because they're usually electronic, not mechanical anymore, and you just connect a 9 volt battery and it pulls the solenoid back and then you're in. And there's, and there's a number of other ways too. Uh, another threat, which was recently in the news, is uh, the implant. So as we said, you get, they can image your device when you're through a checkpoint or whatever else, and they've got an encrypted image, but they need to get a passphrase, or they need to get physical access, they need to get logical access to the machine and do various other stuff. Uh, it's very difficult to detect hardware changes on physical hardware. Uh, there's a variety of them that you can go over. Yeah, like, I mean, to be honest, like, how are you going to run antivirus on that keylogger on the left side? Honestly. Um, what if you have a firmware updated for your Ethernet card? I mean, you don't, there aren't really a lot of technologies available immediately today commercially to solve these problems. Um, also, what about, what if someone removes the keyboard, puts a single layer PCB with a VIA that logs your keystrokes and just transmits, transmits it over RF? There's many different ways to do it, as, uh, as many different um, tools are available in your electronics catalog um, and stuff that you can come up uh, independently if you have a lot more resources, uh, like coming up with a tool on the right called a yeah. cotton mouth. Probably doesn't cost $20,000 a unit to do this commercially. Yeah. Uh, another threat that you face is, of course, network monitoring. You're in a country where the cell phone company is most likely uh, either an organ of the state or is highly licensed by the state. Uh, so they can see a lot of traffic there. They can do over-the-air upgrades. They can do all sorts of stuff to your cell phone. They control all the wide area network access. They can monitor there. They can do stuff at firewall. So you might think, like, oh, a VPN is a great solution to that. And it is. I mean, I love VPNs. But um, they're, they're not so great if your endpoint's compromised. So. The, the countermeasure you've put in place to protect you from network monitoring doesn't protect you if your endpoint gets compromised. So another organization that has a lot of things to fear would be an activist organization. Say a group that gets a lot of highly sensitive documents given to them, or they acquire them somehow, and they're controlling them, and a lot of people really would like those documents. So they need to do things with them, and they're... Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty dangerous. So they have access to documents. The adversary would like to get access to them. Also, knowing all the personnel that are, that are involved in the organization is a big risk, because um, some of those people might not be public about their involvement with the organization. And if they're exposed, they might lose their privileged access, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, subversion of the systems of the organization, and potentially prosecution, persecution, all sorts of bad stuff can happen to you. And it doesn't have to happen in your home country. It can happen in a lot of other places. 
Um, one of the unique problems that activist organizations have is they're usually pretty poorly resourced. They don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of dedicated hardware or anything else. There's a few that, that have been raising a lot of money recently, but in general, they're, especially outside of IT, they have very bad IT. Your average like labor organization group or whatever has, has very minimal uh, computer security and resources for that. So they're using a lot of their personal machines with no real security policy, um, no real full-time sysadmin, nothing like that. They're certainly not security, a full-time security guy. So it's pretty easy to compromise an end user in one of these organizations. You just sort of put up a site that attracts users from that site and uh, compromise them there. And once you compromise their computer, then you can access the systems of their organization. They also face a fairly unique problem that you're familiar with uh, <laughs> at their physical premises. So, yeah. So black bag operations are uh, generally, uh, you know, B and E uh, breaking and entering uh, operations. So uh, you need to get physical access some way, and that can be either picking a lock, um, break, going through a window, bypassing alarms and sensors and switches. Like I'm uniquely familiar with this, uh, as my company does. Uh, teaches the defenses and offenses of it so we know what to look for. And there's many, many different ways you can do it. I mean, it, it, one, of the, one of the things I learned years ago is like, you know, it's great to have a carpenter on staff because you can cut through drywall and repaint it very quickly and no one knows you didn't touch the RFID reader. How many of you have worked in data centers where um, there's no steel wall in, in between the drywall? Yeah, I see a few hands. I'm pretty sure a lot more than you think. Um, I've seen quite a lot of data centers in my time. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, I mean, even uh, triggering uh, request to exit sensors is an example. Uh, turns out you can put a, a little pocket warmer, you know, when you go skiing or snowboarding, you, you know, open up a bag, it heats up, keeps your hands warm. Push that under the door, uh, you'll trigger the inside sensor to release the door lock from the inside as if you're a person leaving. So there's many ways to do this, and I just covered a very small percentage of them. But it, it's, it's really, it's a big and real threat. And I don't think your average activist organization is going to have a super high security physical office because they'd rather spend their money on, on activism rather than physical facilities. Uh, another class of users that are vulnerable are online gaming users. So this is really anybody who's got an important online account. It's not specific to gaming. But uh, one really, really interesting example recently is uh, F-Secure came out with a report that a poker player likes to play poker a lot was in Barcelona. And this was back in December, actually earlier in this month. And uh, he would play poker online. He'd also play physical. So he left his laptop up in his hotel room at sort of like a physical poker competition, went down, was playing poker, and people were compromising his laptop and installing some subversion software on his laptop while he was away. So his online poker accounts got compromised. Yeah. And the really scary thing about this is not that it's happened once. It's that this, they say, was not the first time, is not particularly unusual has a purely commercial profit motive, so it's sort of like a self-financing operation. There's no reason to believe this doesn't happen frequently and on an increasing basis. So one of the things that people think about, uh, if you're um, you know, an evil maid, you have the cards and keys to get in. But what if you're not, and maybe um, you maybe know a local locksmith, or you can bend some metal, you can do something like this with the under the door tool, where you don't need to touch the locking systems at all. You just grab the door handle from the inside. So about a minute. Yeah, it's fine. So you can talk to her. Yeah, so um, what I'm pulling out here actually is a little uh, wrap of steel uh, with a cable inside. Um, and uh, that's called the under the door tool. Uh, it works on lever locks, so you know the handles with the lever. So that one's all uh, wound up. We undo the Velcro and then shove it under the door. I actually have um, it over there. Actually, um, Starbug, who did the uh, Touch ID hack, actually, I have to give one to him. So you guys can keep one here in the country. Um, but yeah, if you want to see it later, come by the locksmith area. Or sorry, lock picking area. And we can do some demos. But yeah, checking to see um, you know, that the door is open or locked, because sometimes it's actually left open. Measure the distance. Slide it under the door. You've seen the top left, the tool going in. Lifting up. One, two, three. On, on some of the handle. And that's it. And once I know it's there, pull the wire, jiggle. And I'm in. So uh, another class of users that we care about that are, that are at risk are journalists. And there's a lot of definition of who's a journalist, but really anybody reporting on this kind of stuff at this point is, is doing journalism. And uh, journalists have, often are very public people. So they themselves are known, 
but they have confidential sources, and the reason why these sources are willing to give information to the journalist is that the journalist protects their uh, anonymity very, very strongly. There have been journalists that have gone to prison for protecting, uh, to, to protect people from, from being compromised, and uh, certainly, and, and worse in other countries. Uh, so this is very important to journalists, and there's some attacks that are, uh, that are pretty unique to journalists, like, uh, well, not, not terribly unique to journalists. Uh, you basically just arrest them and you, have them, you, have, you seize their equipment, and you image it, and you give it back to them, potentially with, um, with malware installed, or if they didn't bother to use crypto, because the majority of them don't, you've got the data there. And they're, they're, they're usually not very rich, so they're, if you seize their equipment for a couple days, they're really worried that they're not gonna be able to get any work done when they get it back, so they're not gonna go out and throw it away and go out and buy new hardware. They're going to take that equipment and keep using it as if nothing had happened, and, uh, and yeah, you win, so. Yeah. yeah. And if there's no evidence that uh, it's been tampered with, it's going to be really hard to pressure your boss to get you a new laptop. Yeah. That's if you're not independent. Yeah. If yeah. you're not an independent <laughs> yeah. Uh, stringer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the other category of people are people in war zones. And that's really the whole range of people that are just sort of like families that live there. If you've got a relative who happens to live in a country that becomes a war zone over time, um, they're at risk because both your personal physical safety is at risk. I mean, obviously it's a war zone. And um, going after contacts and networks. You want to find out all the people that are members of, of certain organizations, you find one of them and you sort of like do a network analysis and find all the people they talk to and all that stuff. And uh, there's a fairly unique problem for, for people in these places where people on both sides are in Middle Eastern countries that are in war zones. They will uh, find somebody who's in a network, they will uh, compromise that person, they'll imprison them, they'll kill them, whatever else, take their systems and continue impersonating them and uh, find everybody else who's in their network, attract them, and arrest or kill them. So it's a, a huge risk for them. It's pretty much the ultimate risk. Uh, so you'd think, as we said earlier, the um, governments were sort of the original people that, uh, that faced these kind of risks, and they had some solutions. But as we'll see, they had solutions, but they were really just for government. They're not really applicable to a lot of other people in a lot of cases, and they're not really foolproof either. So government security is, is certainly not a bulletproof thing. Um, one of the things they've always built on is they have uh, is physical security. Governments have, have long, like way before computers, relied on physical security to keep their records facilities safe. They have a bunch of standards. I'm familiar with the U.S. standards, but a lot of countries have these things where the uh, if you're going to use a computer at a very high security level, you can only do it in a special kind of environment. You don't go to a coffee shop with your laptop. You don't go to a regular office environment with a laptop to process. You do it in a room called a SCIF, a Sensitive Compartmentalized Information Facility. It's basically a bank vault that um, is lined with some metal to block RF shielding, has physical security, so it's got very high security locks, um, monitoring, alarming, everything else. Um, super expensive, like the seals on the doors alone are like five, 10 grand, so you're not really gonna buy these commercially. Uh, they're restricted, a lot of the standards are actually themselves classified in order to build one of these things. Um, they're required for defense contractors in America. It's, it's a big, big deal. Um, one of the things they have actually are embassies, so they actually were able to get all the other countries to come up and, and do some treaties. So there's Vienna and other places where they, um, they decided that all countries' embassies would be sort of inviolate territory of, other, of, of the country extraterritorially. Uh, so they will not be able to be subject to local search or anything else, which is great because a great way to defend against search is to just not be allowed to be searched. Um, unfortunately, like private citizens can't really do that. Uh, they have special couriers that will transport material between sites. Uh, they'll have, they run basically their own carrier service. Sometimes they use commercial carriers, sometimes they have armed security guys that travel with the, the item and, and keep it protected that way. Uh, they've got a lot of other stuff. But basically the, the fundamental thing here is all this stuff is really, really expensive. I mean, one of the things they do that's sort of like the least um, absurd thing they do is they have a dedicated travel pool of laptops that are the only machines that are allowed to be taken out of their facility. So if you're a government user that wants to go to a foreign country for a conference, you don't get to take your work laptop. You take a special laptop that only has access to very minimal things, doesn't have access to home systems, everything else. That works great if you've got like 500,000 employees and they don't really need to do a lot of work during that trip. But if you're a private person who travels to a country to do work, you have to take your stuff with you to do all your work while you're there. Quick question. Quick test. Ah, quick question: Who travels for work with their laptop? Everyone should look around really quick. <laughs> yeah. 
a lot of hands up. No, don't yeah. keep them up. Keep them up. So don't hide it. <laughs> now look yeah. around. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of you do that. Yeah. yeah. That uh, wasn't happening about 20 years ago, FYI. Yeah. Just like that, the landscape has completely yeah. changed. Yeah, and they do some cool stuff with those travel laptops. They actually, when they get them back, they do uh, various forensic analysis on them. Sometimes they, they do physical inspection. Uh, sometimes they x-ray them to see if components have been added to them. They do all sorts of crazy stuff on these things, yeah. uh, depending on who they are. Like, certainly, U.S. agencies usually have more money than a lot of uh, countries do, so they're going to do more of this stuff. But, and if they're going to a high-threat environment, they might do more than if they're going to a friendly country. But, but they do a lot of stuff that's really difficult to do. And they have so much money, they can build their own custom procedures, they can implement great policies, and government employees are really good at obeying um, uh, directives and doing it um, persistently and consistently. So they can have a policy where they have to go do something every day, and, and they'll actually stick to it. Uh, but yeah, custom hardware, detailed accounting procedures, everything like that. Okay. Uh, problem is, it's not completely effective. So it's super expensive and doesn't actually work. Uh. So, um, it turns out uh, certain organizations, when they come up to problems like these, they develop uh, specialized tools. So, as I said at the very beginning, I'm the co-founder of Tool US. Uh, I've been a sport picker for a long time, then I worked for the United States government, learning more stuff, and how the mindset worked of like, you know, you need to get access in these hardened areas. I never worked on those particular problems, but I learned around that. And I eventually started learning about other tools, and there's a, a man by the name of John Fall, who makes tools not generally for the public market. He makes lockpicks for the public market, but he came up with this particular tool uh, about 20, over 20 years ago, I've been told. Uh, it used to be a classified tool. I don't think anyone has seen this ever in public. Um, and so this is basically, we're dropping this right now. <laughs> Um, this tool right here is called the Universal Pin Tumbler Decoder. Um, you can come by the lock picking area later and take a look at it. Uh, basically, what it does is um, it is designed to not pick a lock, but decode a lock. Um, this tool, uh, what it does is it has a very thin wire shim. It doesn't lift the pin, it slides between the pin and the cavity. And it curves back, and you can see, I don't know if you can see it very well um, because of the wire is so thin, but stop by the lock picking area. We'll have more videos online in a bit. Um, this tool is no longer classified, so I'm not going to get in that kind of trouble. <laughs> um, but the tool, I turn up the hypodermic syringe, which carries a needle, or sorry, a little wire, and it slides up. And you can see at the top pin, it might jump a little, see it spins right there? That means I touched it, and I'll feel that on the plunger. And when, when, trained, uh, when you train enough with this tool, you can decode locks in, down in as low as 30 seconds. And the other interesting thing is, to the design of this tool is that you can come back years later as long as the lock has not been repinned. So if you only have time to, like in a dark corner, go by and try the first pin, you, you figure it out, go, go away, tell maybe one of your other uh, black bag operators and say, okay, we got this one, do this one. And if you only have 10 seconds at a time, you can do that and then eventually you'll have persistent access because you will be able to cut the key to code after the fact. So um, these are tools that are, as I said, not available to the, uh, to, to the public market at all, heavily restricted. Um, hell, I can't even really buy them. <laughs> but I do have one from a friend. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting to show uh, the public what kind of tools are available. Now, I said this is 20 years old. Um, there are way more sophisticated tools today uh, to give you some perspective as to what is available. As you've been also seeing through the other talks, there are other tools that most people didn't think existed. And there's other tools that, the other thing that's unique about government is they are willing to spend a lot of money to go after a single target. Uh, in the case of the U.S. and the Soviet Union back from, I think, the 50s or 60s, U.S. built this great embassy in, in Moscow, and uh, they got a gift from the, the uh, Soviets of a seal, a great seal of the United States. It was really, really pretty. And uh, they, did, they thought, oh, does it have a microphone inside it? It had no um, active components or anything else inside it. It was just this nice seal. So they hung it up in one of their sensitive meeting rooms. And it turns out it actually had a piece of metal inside it that when you um, irradiated it with a RF from an outside thing from one of the Soviet's facilities, turned it into a microphone that would remotely uh, transmit a, a thing. So they spent, I don't know how much time coming up with this thing for a single room, single attack, but pretty effective. Mm. And, and there's no reason to think they haven't continued doing that over time, given the $50 billion budget for this kind of stuff every year. So it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, but, and the other reason why, it, so there's these weird technical things, so those are the advantages government has, but they also have some disadvantages. One of their big disadvantages is actually their, their other strength, is that they're so big and they have so much money and so much staff. That means they've got a lot of insiders, 
And one of the biggest risks to them is that they have insiders that are going to either accidentally not comply with security policy or willfully not comply with security policy. And pretty much over recently, we've seen some of the consequences of that. So uh, they, they have that threat, whereas a small, an individual certainly doesn't have that threat, and a uh, small organization generally doesn't have that threat as frequently. And sometimes they just screw up. Like they went to the US uh, Commerce uh, Secretary, went to China on a big meeting. They did everything right most of the time. And they just sort of like left a laptop containing the Commerce Secretary's, la uh, left a bag containing his laptop like somewhere. And uh, yeah, so if the problem is they have to be right all the time. And if you screw up once, yeah, that's not so great. So where do we go from here? Um, we have all these types of attacks, and we think we have all these defenses, and uh, it turns out they're really not that good, especially when you don't have a well-resourced uh, entity to, to take care of having a dedicated security staff to train employees and everything else. Well, there's SEALs. Not this SEAL. <laughs> these kinds of SEALs. So um, SEALs come in many shapes and sizes. Um, I actually... Uh, I, I have a particular way of describing them, but uh, where I used to work at the vulnerability assessment team at Argonne, they have a great uh, description of uh, tamper-evident uh, devices. And I'm just going to read it right here. So um, tamper-evident devices are uh, used to detect and report an unauthor unauthorized entry. So let's take an idea of what it is. And perhaps discourage it. Uh, unlike intrusion or burglar alarms, SEALs report unauthorized entry after the fact. They must be inspected either manually or electronically. So they can be, uh, you know, tamper evident tapes, stickers, seals. Like the peel of an orange is actually a tamper indicating device. Um, if it looks like the wrong color, then you don't eat it. That's did its job. Um, but it didn't help you prevent that. Um, and they also, um, to do, um, so a seal does not need to resist a physical entry. Uh, actually, it's supposed to be broken, um, but it's supposed to indicate to the person um, that it has uh, been opened. Uh, in other words, a seal is not a lock. Uh, indeed, some seals are made of paper or plastic uh, and can be easily removed or cut off. Uh, certain security products known as barrier seals um, they uh, do provide a physical barrier to entry, uh, but again, they're not also very often reusable. Uh, these are hybrid devices, part lock and part seal. Um, barrier seal should be used with care. Uh, barrier seal is often a compromise, uh, a compromise of a product, uh, neither optimum as a lock or as a seal. Uh, it's a dual function tends to complicate issues about how to best use the product, so whether you use it on, like, on a laptop or in your car or on a shipping container, et cetera, et cetera. Um, seals um, also require a very strong procedures to be put in place to be effective. If you don't have a policy of having someone check and actually checking things, not just looking at it, but seeing that the serial numbers line up, um, does, the does the device look like it's been messed with? Did it peel back? Did it change color? Any of these different factors, if you're not checking for those things, which can take a, and require a trained eye, they're not effective. And so you need to have uh, procurement and storage and record keeping uh, procedures to you know, make these things work. So anyway, turns out physical seals also really suck. <laughs> um, aside from having what you think are good, thing, uh, good seals, like you see them on the market, it turns out that um, there's an event at DEF CON called the Tamper Village, and uh, they've been, uh, people have been taught in the last few years, and now there's competitions about how fast people can defeat these seals. As you see on the table over here in the picture, you'll see a lot of plastic wraps and beads, and those often are defeated by, you know, shims made out of Coke cans or beer cans. Um, people also use uh, solvents for the pa paper materials and plastics, like uh, heptane, acetone, a lot of these things are over the counter. Uh, and it turns out that uh, it doesn't take a very long time to defeat SEALs. Uh, the VAT did a study uh, over the years, and they keep adding to it as they do more SEALs that they haven't seen. But as you can see here, um, the average time to defeat uh, average um, SEALs, uh, even high-end ones, is around a minute and a half. Uh, and the median is even less than that. Like I, I'm, I, I, a lot of them I can defeat around that time frame myself. And I teach that too. Um, and now I know the defenses for these. And it turns out it's not really expensive to do so. Um, some, some of them are really expensive, uh, but um, yeah, so. And so there's another problem is that users are lazy. Uh, this, this requirement that seals be verified by, by the user and have a big security policy and everything else, We've, we've got some sort of analogs in the regular computer security world, uh, things like SSL certificate checking and SSH keys and everything else. People just click through. They don't, they don't really put any effort into it. So when they've got a choice, they're going to they're gonna skip ahead. Um, so it's really un unlikely we're going to build a great system that depends on users making correct security decisions all the time. Uh, 
There's another feature that'd be really nice, remote attestation. Uh, it'd be nice, like this whole cloud thing with like remote services and all these other things, it'd be nice if the cloud service that actually had your data knew that your laptop was secure before you connected to it and did all this stuff. So um, you need a way that your computing device can prove to the remote server, either organization server or a commercial service or whatever, that it's actually intact. There are devices that do this. The problem is they're not really ideal. Uh, one of the classes of devices is something called a hardware security module. They are basically computers inside little safes. They've got tamper evidence all over them and tamper response. So if you try to mess with them physically or logically or anything else, they erase the contents before you can get to them. Uh, the problem is they're like $20,000 each. And there's maybe two or three big manufacturers of them, and they're big defense contractors slash government vendors. So if an activist organization were to try to buy one on the website, one, they probably wouldn't get one because they're export controlled. Two, if they were having one shipped to them, it would be one of those packages that would get sort of like mysteriously delayed for a couple of hours and replaced with one that's actually evil. Uh, so they couldn't trust it. Um, and they're so expensive that no one's really going to do like a teardown analysis of a $20,000 device where you've got to burn like five or six of these devices and everything else. Like no private organization is going to, like no private individual is going to do that. And you can't really trust like a standards agency to do this for you. Yeah. Uh, so there's also smart cards, which are great. Um, they're cheap. They're in all your cell phones, the SIM cards, they're in ID cards, they're in payment cards, everything else. The problem is they don't actually provide enough physical protection for this threat model. Um, they provide protection for individual credentials, but in this case, if you compromise any of the systems, you're going to compromise all of them, so it's not so great. Uh, there's also trusted computing. So it's the, uh, the TCG, TPM, TXT, all these acronyms from people that have been really around since like the mid, late 90s. Uh, it's inadequate. Um, it's inadequate for a few reasons. One, not really widely deployed, doesn't really work, but maybe we can fix that. But uh, second, it doesn't protect the whole thing that you need to protect. It was designed to do basically DRM, uh, digital rights management, to keep people from pirating movie content. Uh, we can see how well that's worked. And um, it, it's not really designed to protect a single machine, a single computer from a focused attack. Uh, you can still attack the memory, you can attack all sorts of stuff. So it's insufficient. And it's a pain, so it's not really a great solution either. And certainly it's not a great solution if somebody has physical access to your machine to do stuff with it. So where do we go from here? <clears throat> uh, you know, people think it's a good idea to you know, take a notebook, write down things, and check it, but it's not really objective. Uh, you need uh, machine verifiable and repeatable tests. So quick quiz for the audience. Who can tell me what is different about these two pictures? Raise your hand and I'll point you out and you can yell it. Anybody? No, no, seriously, like it's audience participation. <laughs> Anyone? Just shout it out. What's different? No one? I know, it's kind of hard up here. Okay, maybe this will be a little easier. It's a technique called blink comparison. What's changing now? Can you see it? Right. <laughs> yes, the screw. Um, this is a simple technique you can use developed by astronomers many, 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 many moons ago. Uh, and it makes it a lot easier for you to tell that something's changed. Like, you can't just say, I, I turned the screw 38 degrees. It's just not going to really cut it. You, unless you have like, uh, you know, a method uh, with photography, like a mobile phone or some other device, um, it's just you, you won't know if something's been tampered with or it's just you're paranoid, uh, even if it's true. So where do we go from here? Yeah, so the problem is, so this is a great check. And if you use a cell phone to do this check, it's, uh, it's easier to do, cheaper to do, everything Sorry, else. Sorry, what? Someone shouted? Oh, OK. Right. OK. Never mind. So uh, it's easier to do. But the problem is it doesn't really address the problem of users are, come, are pretty lazy. Uh, what you do is you'd ask a user to say, are the seals intact on your machine before you log into this website? Please check. Check this box if it's secure. Uh, yeah, you know how well it's going to work. So. What we did is we came up with a way that we could make the um, seal verification basically like a two-factor authentication. So it's a machine check that then sends something to a remote server that's located in your, in your home data center, uh, verifies the integrity of the seal, and then sends you back a short-lived credential. Right now it's a Kerberos ticket, but we could do SSL cert. We could do all sorts of stuff or just allow you access to the resource. Um, and this basically makes it non-skippable by the user. If the user doesn't do the check, they don't get access. Pretty fair. And it works great. It's cheap. It uses cheap seals. It uses cell phones that everyone's got with them. Uh, the cell phone is considered to be secure because you have it with you at all times. 
and it can protect in a lot of these scenarios that we've outlined. Um, you can go through the business yeah. traveler, all these people. Yeah. So uh, how would you apply these things to your own devices? So uh, first off with the business traveler, nowadays people are starting to make USB port plugs, like ultra port uh, plugs like in your ThinkPads. Um, what you want to do is put them in. They disable the port physically. You'll have to disassemble the machine. So if you're putting tamper evidence stickers over all the control surfaces, which are areas that you can open to get internal access, it's a good start. Um, then again, you've got to make sure you have a uh, tamper indicating device that is very frangible. You don't want something that could be peeled back and put back uh, very quickly, unless someone doesn't know that that actually is a tamper indicating seal. Maybe you just have your EFF sticker as an example on there, and they think it's just decoration. But really, it's, you to, it's to tell you that something has happened. Um, and then activist organizations at their headquarters, maybe just putting you know, a pen on a table in a particular way and then you photograph it. You have to do like a photograph. You can't just say, I placed it there. It's, you're really going to miss stuff. And so what you do is to get access to, let's say, a filing cabinet, you maybe have to move something. And if they don't place it back directly, you'll know something has happened. Someone has been there. Uh, just make sure if it's something light like paper, you don't have a, a fan blowing around and just knock things over. It'd be useless. Uh, online gaming user, um, you can use the safe, but you should you know, use seals in the safe. Um, I didn't really cover covert traps, but covert traps are, um, are you know, your secret ta tamper indicating devices, like a piece of hair. Like you put it on a door jam, lick it, place it. It's very hard to see, very hard to detect, unless someone knows to look for it. But then you have other seals around just as distraction, but they also are covering important parts. Um, journalists operating in dangerous environments, they're kind of the same thing. Um, uh, but also, if you're going to go meet somebody in a particular area, um, you know, you clear it ahead of time. You go check out, and maybe you're going to be in a room where you know no one will be, but you want to make sure that after the time between you clean it, clear it, check it, and you come back, no one's been there. So you put seals on doors, maybe you move a chair in a particular way um, so that you can check again with a photograph. And, then, and for people living in war zones, one of the ways you could use this would be when you're sending information to, or sending physical items to people, you put them in a sealed container that has seals, and you send them out of band through email or through some other means uh, the integrity information for that seal so they can verify that the package hasn't been tampered with and they receive it so they know it's actually from you. It's basically a way to cryptographically sign a physical item, which is kind of cool. Uh, the problem with all these, the, the, the seals we think are, are a great solution to this, but they've got some definite problems. The biggest problem is they can't go back in time. Uh, you, you need to, um, if you've got a device and you just show up with a new device and you ask me, like, is this device tampered with? Uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to give you a good answer because the, there's so many ways you can tamper with something. If you don't have a good baseline measurement on that device, you won't be able to compare it to anything. So you'll be trying to find like vendor specs for it, but there's a rata. It basically isn't going to work. I would just tell you, buy a new device. The, um, and most of these devices, they're not designed to be very tamper evident at all, because tamper evidence is like the enemy of easy manufacturing and cheap manufacturing. So people want cheap stuff. Yeah. Uh, so the problem is we need to convince people that they should be worried about this in advance of having a problem and sort of implement these policies earlier on. Yeah. Okay. Operational security is not retroactive. You've got to be doing it at the beginning or something bad is going to happen down the line. So. And so we've got some areas for research, uh, other people or us or whatever. Um, so a major area of this is actually policy, knowing that you need to do this or that it isn't, is a threat, that physical attacks are a threat and that there's, you need to do countermeasures. Um, computing devices that are designed for better tamper evidence and response, um, maybe a computer that doesn't have a bunch of ports on it and a bunch of direct DMA access memory ports external to the system and things like that would be nice. Um, better ties between the SEAL technology and trusted computing technology. So I sort of wrote off the TCG uh, trusted computing stuff from a physical perspective, but it turns out if you combine that with SEALs, you can actually get some pretty good protection that you wouldn't get with either alone. And integration in a, an organizational environment into things like your VPN system, your mobile device management, network access control, because if this is like a little separate system that doesn't really touch the rest of your systems, you'll ignore it and it won't actually use it. But if you tie it into your VPN, so you only get access to your VPN when the seal check is verified, only get access to uh, other resources that way, it'll work really well. And the seals we're using are not really designed for this. They're sort of, we're, re, we're reusing seals. The, the sensor platform we have is a cell phone that has a, it's a decent camera, but not a great camera, especially for macro type stuff. And a lot of the seals are designed to be inspected by humans visually at like a very forensic level. So it would be nice to have seals that are designed and optimized to be better sensible by the verifiable by a phone. And maybe other kinds of uh, thing rather than visual. Uh, so a bunch of stuff like that, and I'm sure there's other areas of research that are, that are appealing as well. 
So in conclusion, we, we, we're now realizing that there's a much wider variety of users at risk. It's not just government entities and uh, in, intelligence communities, but it's basically everyone in this room. Um, new technical solutions are needed. Um, most, of the stuff, uh, most of the knowledge base is kept up in those organizations, and there's not a lot of that publicly available just yet. There's a lot of people that are amateurs pr uh, playing this game, and some professionals, and I, I, at least in where I'm from, I know most of them. Um, and there's not enough of them to go around to start teaching everybody. And also, remote verified seals are a great solution uh, because then you have a, like, you know, a, a networked resource that can do a little more verification than the person locally can do and also can cut them off from access. Uh, and then also, it's slightly complex enough that you may need a little help just to get started. And so there's other than just putting seals on there, but having a good baseline of policies and procedures. So anyway, that's our talk. <laughs> So uh, we'll open up the floor for a few Q and A's. Uh, Christine. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we have we have time for questions. Um, please line up at the microphones. We have four microphones. Um, I can't tell. Are there microphones up top? Um, and we're also taking questions from the internet. So if you're watching our live stream, haven't made it to the Congress hall yet, uh, please. Um, we are taking from Twitter and IRC. Um, so. <laughs> Let's get started. How about microphone two? Hi, uh, less a question and more a very brief uh, story about uh, physical access that I'm pretty sure even you probably haven't heard of. I work at a robotics company. Uh, we uh, exist, the company runs mostly on interns and visiting researchers that come and go. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this actually happens. Um, one of the one of our interns, uh, uh, we had him over for a, a semester and uh, for a sp semester, great break. Did some great work. Decided to have him back. Pulled his physical access, his hid key. Uh, pulled his other access, but because this is an academic environment, you want to encourage collaboration while they're back at their home university. Didn't pull the VPN keys. Oops. Oops. Have him back for a second uh, term, and he gets there all bright. And he's a very young, industrious intern. He gets back for his first day of his second term, all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and realizes, hey, he doesn't have door access yet, but he does have his VPN keys, and he's sitting outside the off. He's sitting outside the building, and so he pops open his laptop, VPNs into the internal network. SSH is into a robot, <laughs> drives the robot over the door, over to the door, and runs the door opening program from the inside. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like I want to hire him. <laughs> and and as a re and actually we checked this. There was uh, there was because it was from the inside. There was no record in the hid logs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And there Often is ACL do only a, uh, an SSH. Uh, you can only tell he started a VPN session. There's no logging of like what machine he VPNed into because the robot is basically a little Linux box on wheels. Yeah, interesting uh, follow up to that. And that's a great story. Thank you. That, that's very entertaining. Um, yeah, a lot of companies, they, they don't link their uh, VPN with their. Um, their um, you know other credentials and systems like if someone's desktop fires up but they didn't walk into the building and they they're supposedly there but they're not um, you know the CTO and the CSO uh, don't actually like, talk to each other often so there, there's a lot of problems with that so like, as an example right there you you don't have um, you know exit control access logs um, and also you're not logging the robots so <laughs> interesting use case but um, but yeah that is a big problem. Okay, I understand we have a number of questions from the internet. Uh, there's just one really at the moment. Oh, um, voice <laughs> from above. <laughs> Go question, on. question from IRC. Uh, are you aware of any open source uh, hardware security module or something that you could build yourself? <laughs> Ryan, uh, you can take that. ShmooCon in about a month. I'm doing a presentation on that. There are actually are four or five projects to do Something like that. One from uh, uh, DNSSEC. Uh, one. For, there's, there's, a, there's a few. Uh, people have used like Raspberry Pis. They've used various other devices. They generally focus on separating out the. They, they, they focus on the logical protection as opposed to high-end physical protection. But 
ultimately, I think the best way to do a, an, an open source HSM is to publish a great design that can use commodity components because it's really hard to tell if a, if a IC has been compromised. But if you can use a variety of cheap commodity components, you can, you can put them together, you can buy them from various sources and do stuff like that. So yeah, there's, a, there's some interesting work in that area that, that uh, will be open source and public. OK, microphone four. Uh, hello. Um, I have uh, more uh, request, not exactly a question. Uh, could you please show again the slide where you compared those two photographs? Because I didn't see anything. Oh, sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's hard on this screen because I don't think it is a 1080p and uh, it's not very bright. So I'll stand right over here and I don't have a la laser pointer, but it's that screw. Oh, Oop. sorry. Oop. And now I'm going to have a seizure. Um, that screw right there, can you see it? You might need to get closer. That's the thing, like, uh, it, when blown up with this contrast, it's really hard. But when you actually look at your laptop screen, it's very easy to tell. So again, walk closer to the screen, you'll definitely see it. But that's the thing. The point was, it's a very minute detail, and if you aren't vigilant, and if you're just taking notes or something, that, that's practically useless. I mean, you're just really going to go on the side of error that something happened instead of actually having proof. OK, thank you. You're welcome. OK, microphone two. Um, the um, description said something that you will present something about physically unclonable functions uh, for hardware temper detection, if I understood it correctly. Would you mind elaborate on that? What, you, what results you got there and what kind of protection you can achieve using that? Yeah, so we, we did, because of the time constraint of the talk, we pulled out uh, two slides. And one of them, uh, aside from uh, physical, physical and clonable functions, which are un like in our context, my context for work is you know, devices uh, with unique uh, characteristics of manufacturing. Um, I, you know, we'll actually put it up in the slides on the way out uh, when we upload them. We had two, two change batteries. So we had the same laptops um, and the identical batteries. But when you swap them, and they were from the same line, you could easily tell back and forth which things are changed. So if someone swaps out a component, it turns out uh, through you know, plastics manufacturing, even milling, they'll look slightly different. But it's hard to tell visually side by side. But if you do a quick blink comparison, you can tell. And the same thing with like, uh, you know, the stickers. The stickers themselves are uh, you know, puffs. Um, you might be thinking more of the ones on, at chip, le chip level, uh, but this is more macro. Yeah. So. And we've also done non-sticker um, seals, uh, basically paint, special paint. Uh, dynamic things like uh, metallic paint, glitter, things like that. Yeah. Uh, those are also a form of physical and clonable function. There's also the array of uh, fiber optic cable where it's, uh, it, it's ra sort of randomized. Really anything where it's, you physically can't copy it in the manufacturing time where it's a lot, there's randomness in the physical manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. uh, the technique of verifying and doing remote verification works just the same with those. Uh, we can't do this with um, like chips because we don't have an electron microscope on our cell phone right now, but we could we soon, can do this for, soon. We're, we're, the goal is to be able to do it, the sensors that will work with the phone. So we yeah. have to do macro level type stuff. OK, so it's not about smart cards with physical unclonable functions. It's just physical changes with you, which you photograph with your yeah, cell phone. And yeah, device started. level things, not, not, yeah. a, not yeah. chip level. Yeah, further up yeah. the chain, they're both physically unclonable functions. Uh, they're just at different scales. OK, then I would have a follow up question if sure. I can. Yeah. How does it actually work in practice? Because uh, you leave your hotel room in the morning. You come back in the evening, you have yes. different lightning conditions, you mm -hmm. cannot put the cell phone into exactly the same position. How does it work in this scenario? I'll take that. That's actually really easy to do. You close the shades, turn the lights on, so you have a consistent lighting condition, and that you put your mobile device or camera device in a, in a jig format. So you find a surface that you can butt your camera up to and lock it. So you, like a shelf, push it against the wall, stand to the side, take a photo, and almost every single time it'll be identical. Uh, and, then, and then you can correct it on your, on your laptop or other, other devices and just overlay, uh, overlay them and then flip them back and forth. You can use like for Macintosh preview. Um, and like, actually, I don't use Windows. So. Yeah. There's also registration marks that you can put in the image to assist it. We have a, some not very great OpenCV code right now that tries to, tries to do this. Yeah. Um, that uh, which will be open and released. The, um, you can put registration marks in to make this process a lot easier. The problem is you have skew and stuff on the camera, so it's actually a fairly complicated yeah. uh, problem, but it, it yeah. mostly works. Yeah, there is a product in, in the iPhone store that does blink comparison. The problem is uh, it, it's, it's very inaccurate because it wants you to hold it, and a human is not going to be able to replicate the same you know, you know, parallax 
for your shot every time. It's going to be slightly off, and it's just it's going to be very. I've used it. It's not very great. And so, as I said, like basic things, like find something in the room that's immovable that probably hasn't moved. The desk may have moved, but find, find something that's nailed down, like a, a shelf. And then you can just do that shot, and you get a very reproducible. Yeah. And, if you, you, yeah. and certain kinds of seals are going to be much, much easier to verify than other kinds of seals. Yeah. They'll have yeah. large areas. Thank you for the question. OK, do we have a question from the internet? Yeah, another question from the internet is, uh, how would you make your own seal? And uh, if you were to get a seal, uh, what, what would you be looking for into a, a good seal? So a good seal, you want something that's um, easily frangible, but it's not going to break by accidental use. Um, like um, I, I can't, I don't want to give away all the traps because then that gives my adversaries an advantage. But a good one, it, which is easy to use, is a pearlescent paint or nail polish. Put it on all your screws. Take a photograph, um, specifically ones that have a lot of glitter in it, because it's going to be very difficult to replicate yeah. that. Yeah, there's really two classes, of big classes of attacks. There's taking an intact seal, removing it from a device, tampering with the device, or tampering with the device without breaking the seal, and there's counterfeiting the seal itself. Uh, c conventional seals, a lot of cases, depend on like mass manufacturing being really hard, and unit one, quantity one costing the same as like quantity 10 million. Uh, that's not so much true anymore with a lot of manufacturing technologies. I can copy something pretty easily. So I take your device that's protected by a seal, cut the seal up, destroy your seal, and just make a new one and put it back on, and you won't be able to tell. Um, that's, that's a threat, but certain kinds of things like the glitter are going to be very difficult to, to do yeah. that with. And, and it's incredibly cheap, too. And it looks pretty. Yeah, and cheap <laughs> is a major, major uh, problem. Also, it needs to be fairly durable because you don't want it to break in incidental use. There's some tricks yeah. you can do uh, to, to help against that, but, but yeah. Yeah, so like stickers, like cheap, crappy stickers. Um, one of the things we've been coming up with is actually time decay stickers, uh, where um, if it, when you sync it with the VPN service, the, you apply the seal, and it will, the color will fade away. And when you take it, the system, of course, will know what the general decay should have been. So someone will have to have like 100 or 1,000 seals prepped over time consistently, fading, to, to know to get it at the right time. But also, if they, you know, they could time out or not get the right one after three tries. And then you know that you won't be able to get back in the system. And that's a, that's a good thing. OK, microphone four. Hi, the discussion you just had reminded me of a paper from Princeton University, I think from last year, okay. about pieces of paper. And they found that pieces of ordinary paper were actually more at the microscopic level yeah. quite physically distinct from each other. Uh, yeah. And that I think so. an ordinary scanner was able to reveal okay. patterns of wood fibers in the paper that were distinct from piece of paper to piece of paper to piece of paper. I believe that. Um, yeah. And that was quite scary from a privacy point of view because, for example, the company that makes <laughs> the paper could actually have internal serial numbers of the sheets of paper that they sell. It's like sell. banknotes or yeah. your printer yeah. cartridges. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Um, so I guess from a SEALS point of view, I wonder if with a sensor that people might have, if you could actually use maybe sheets of paper and the wood fiber patterns in them yeah, that, as that a is, physically unclonable function. Yeah. That's definitely a legitimate a, method. Yeah. Um, yeah, I yeah. Would, and yes, that is a legitimate method. Yeah. Uh, though having a flatbed scanner with you on your trip it seems a little more unlikely. So we're, we do our best to find ways to use the tools available to you currently. So but, do you think but you can do that. Do you think there's a prospect, um, I don't know what level of magnification you need, that the cameras in phones at some point soon might actually be able to get some of that patterning uh, you under could some lighting conditions? Yeah, definitely if you had a, one of those external little like $30 macro lenses on your camera, you'd be, pr you'd be pretty well served there. Yeah. Um, we can look and look at this. It actually looks like an interesting thing. Yeah, uh, actually, send us I an email. Papers, we'll, yeah. We'd love to chat more about that. Cool. Yeah. OK, do we have one more question from the internet? No, OK. All right. Sounds like cool. we're all good. All right, well, guys, thank you again. Thank you for having us.